Well, the uh, the second inverse trig function we try um the second trig substitution for, um we tried to do ended up as kind of a fiasco, which this can happen once or twice a semester, but let's try to do it right this time. The substitution we're looking at is the square root of x squared minus a squared. This is the kind of thing, again, all of these trig substitutions are things that might show up if you're looking at right angles and the Pythagorean theorem. And the substitution we suggested here was a times the secant of theta. Remember, that's because, I mean, if we want to relate this angle theta to sides of the triangle that are not this awful square root, it's going to be the cosine of theta. But when you actually solve for x, that cosine will move into the denominator. And become the secant of theta. And this isn't something that needs to be learned separately. I mean, hopefully you know the derivative of the secant, but when we change x, we'll also be changing dx. And I guess the nicest thing you can say about trig substitution is that it doesn't, I mean, when you do a U substitution, it's sometimes like, well, do I have DU? I don't quite have DU. I need to put something in and then I need to do something else. Um, trig substitution, whatever its other merits or flaws, is in the first step totally mechanical. Everywhere x appears, you replace it with something. When dx appears, you replace it with something. And again, although um, I'm making my life easier with this example, but this thing you're subtracting doesn't have to be a perfect square. If it's something else, you still can let A be a square root. You can still do the substitution. As I say, though, I'm making my life easier. Four is two squared. And then we have x up here, the square root of x squared minus four. And the reason, again, that I'm drawing this triangle is that if I get an answer that has like a cosine of theta in it, let's say, having this triangle will let me turn a cosine of theta into x's and y's. I'm not expecting a cosine specifically, that was just an example. So that is the trigonometric substitution. 
And let's see what happens this time. Um, and we'll be super careful. So x squared is four times the secant squared of theta. which is actually a really nice thing to have in the denominator, as we'll see. This square root, then, four secant squared of theta minus four, and this dx, two times the secant times the tangent. Half of the whiteboard was not enough. This always um, gets this way, made way through the problem. And the point of trig substitution is to make the square root go away. Um, last time, and <laughs> I mean, for my online students, it was such a mess. I did the wrong substitution. I did not bother to put it on canvas. So um, you won't know what I'm talking about when I say last time. But um, last time I tried to use the Pythagorean identity to get rid of the square root. And when I did that, I should have realized I'd used the wrong substitution, but I made that common mistake that because I thought I knew what was going to happen, I just skimmed through and I didn't notice that what was meant to happen wasn't happening. So let's be really clear about this square root this time. So we can, we'll always have, the way this substitution works, we'll always have the same number appearing twice in the square root. So we can always pull that number out. And get a secant squared minus one. And then Whatever we have here will always be a squared. So when we use the fact that the square root of a product is the product of the square root, that will always turn into an A outside of the square root. And now the secant squared minus one is probably not something we have committed to memory, although maybe we should, but I know that I never did. But this is going to come from the Pythagorean identity. If the sine squared plus the cosine squared is one. And the secant has a cosine in the denominator.
secant squared minus one. Well, let, let's forge on. Maybe I'm borrowing trouble. The secant is one over the cosine. So the secant squared is one over the cosine squared. I'm borrowing trouble. This is going to work out fine. So I think, I hope. So the sine squared over the cosine squared. Yes, is the tangent squared plus one equals the secant squared. And I should have just not said anything and trusted to the process. Although I don't know that that's the best life advice. But in this case, the um, if you do the substitution correctly, you'll always find that what's under the square root is a square. That is to say, two times the secant squared minus one is two times the square root of the tangent squared. And for the moment, we're going to say that the square root of the tangent squared is the tangent. And that's a simplification. It's actually the absolute value of the tangent, but we won't worry about that for now. So let's copy what we have here. We've got this integral. We've got a two times a secant times a tangent. We've got a d of theta. And then in the denominator, we've got a four, we've got a secant squared. And that square root is two times the tangent of theta. Brilliant. So this um, actually taking this integral this is something that looks uh, more formidable than it is. I mean, you probably see some of the substitution, not substitution, some of the cancellation that's going to occur. That tangent and that tangent will go away. That two and that two will go away. And this secant, and one of those secants will go away. One over four times the secant of theta d theta. And, uh, this, this probably, at uh, first blush, seems like a uh, formidable integral, but what is one over the secant? Is it like negative cosine? Um, that's, that's very close. There is no, um, there is no negative. But the secant oh. okay. is one over the cosine. 
So one over one over the cosine is the cosine. And that one over four and just hang out. in front. Okay, so the antiderivative of the cosine is what? Sine, exactly correct. One fourth the sine of theta plus c. And now this isn't our answer um, because what's this Theta. This theta isn't our real variable. It's just something we made up so that we'd be able to get rid of a square root. Well, again, the uh, the point of drawing this triangle isn't just to let you know you know, figure out what substitution to do. It's also to help you simplify once you get to the end. Um, so the sine of theta opposite over hypotenuse, the square root of x squared minus 4, all divided by x. It's, it's interesting, or, or maybe interesting is pushing it. I mean, the, oh, what I, I do, I mean, there, there's, you know, trigonometric substitution can be kind of touchy, we've seen that, but it is interesting to me, this idea that we have these square roots and they have no trig functions in them and somehow we create these trig functions and then somehow we make the trig functions go away and we're back to having a square root. I've said that um, I think trig substitution often looks like a magic trick, like magician is doing something weird, and then this transformation occurs. Questions about the example? Really not that bad. Oh, I mean, but when you first see this, you'll need practice probably before you say that any of these are not so bad, but I mean, it, it was um, it was a straightforward integral to take, for example. You could we could have done a trig substitution and instead of having a cosine, we'd have a cosine squared, and then we'd have to go to our textbook to look up how to integrate that because we never learn. Um there are kind of a few notes I want to make on this. And this is kind of an unusual note. Because usually when we're talking about definite integrals, there's nothing much to say. You, uh, you just you take the indefinite integral, then you plug the limits in. Great. But let's, uh, let's take a look at this. 1 over x squared times the square root of x squared minus 4. Come on, Desmos, is this it? No, cozy earth. That is not where I was trying to bring us. Let's try this again. I think this might be desos.com. 
1 over x squared times the square root of x squared minus 4. So this is what it looks like. And the thing that I'm trying to um, get at here is that there's this whole region where this function isn't defined. And I don't know if we've said this explicitly, but when you're using the fundamental theorem, you need the function to be defined in the interval you're looking at. Like, so we can't integrate from negative four to positive six, for example, because if we did that, there would be this region in the middle. We could integrate from negative six to negative four. We could integrate from positive four to positive six. But both the limits of integration are on the right side of this gap here. So, for a definite integral, and if you're doing this secant substitution, it's always going to look something like that. With the secant substitution, there's always going to be this gap where the function is not defined. And then it's, um, so the limits of integration are either both on the right or both on the left. If the limits of integration are both on the right, we're golden. We do what? we did and no further comment is required we take the definite integral i mean we take the indefinite integral and then um we plug in the limits and we subtract and everything's great if they're both on the left Then when the square root of the tangent squared shows up, it becomes a negative tangent. So again, this is because the square root of the tangent squared is not the tangent. The The square root of the tangent squared is the absolute value of the tangent. So what we're doing, um, I mean, when we throw in that negative sign is we're saying, well, we're actually off by a negative sign. We have the tangent, the tangent's negative, but actually everything here is positive, and we have to put a negative sign in to balance things out. Um, this never happens with the previous substitution, with the sign substitution. With the sign, you always can say that the square root is just a trig function. You never have to put any negative signs in. It never happens with the third substitution, which we'll do briefly. It's only in this one specific case. 
And I don't even know if like, there's any problems in the homework related to this, but I wanted to point it out because it's a good example of how, you know, I love technology. Here I am on Desmos. But like if you tell Wolfram Alpha or something, you know, take the integral of this thing, it will do what we just did, and it will give you this integral, and Wolfram Alpha won't recognize, you know, that sometimes there might be a negative side here. It just gives you the positive solution. So it's something to be aware of, because it's something well, I haven't checked Wolfram Alpha recently. It's always updating, but last time I checked, that was true. So just something to bear in mind. So the third substitution I don't want to dwell on. I mean, we've already spent three days on trig substitution which is one more day than I was hoping to. I don't want to make it four. But the trig substitutions are the same functions we worked with when we were looking at inverse trig functions, where you know you're so used to the sine, cosine, and tangent being kind of the main three. But when we were doing inverse trig stuff, we suddenly, instead of the cosine, we had the secant. And now you've seen the same thing with trig substitution. You start with the cosine, but by the time you're done, it's turned into the secant. The tangent will be the remaining trig substitution that we do. And I didn't know how much time we have left. So I didn't um, create a problem that I know would work nicely. So that's fine. What I'm going to do is just uh, put something on the board. And we might not, we might be able to take the integral in the end, or we might not, but we'll be able to see how this substitution works. Let's see. Again, it's, it's important to have this picture. This picture was what allowed us to go from the sign of theta actually knowing what the sign of theta was. Um, let's say, in fact, why don't we... Why don't we keep things uh, relatively straightforward? Well, not straightforward, but... Let's not throw in a bunch of fractions and additional x's. Let's just look at what happens to that square root. Because the point of all of this is to get rid of the square root. So let's see if we do accomplish that goal. And just for variety and for the last of these problems, what am I doing? I am just determined to mess trig substitution up. Um, for the last of these problems, I picked one where A isn't just some nice number. 
we've got the addition, but five is not a perfect square. That's five though. It's the square root of five squared. This is, honestly, this is the only substitution I find easy to remember because it's also, I mean, it's really similar to the inverse tangent integral, where if you have x squared plus a squared, that turns into the arc tangent. But anyway, we'll try letting x be the tangent. dx, then, is the secant squared theta. And let's see what happens under that square root. So, Five times the tangent squared of theta, that's x squared, plus five. Then dx, so the square root of five times the secant squared of theta d theta. And as I say, unless, because I just made this sort of up off the top of my head, unless we get very lucky, we're not actually going to be able to take the resultant integral. But I just want to see what's going on under this square root. Can we turn this into a square and get rid of the square root? So just as in the other cases we've looked at, we pull the constant out of the square root. And we get the tangent squared of theta plus one. And again, you could, I mean, maybe arguably you should memorize the alternative forms of the, uh, of the Pythagorean identity, but I never have, and it's probably too late now. Every time I'm doing one of these problems, I just say, well, we want a tangent. The tangent is the sine over the cosine. So to get a tangent, we want to divide by a cosine, and we get beautiful, the tangent squared plus one. That's exactly what we have on under the square root. And it equals the secant squared of theta. One over the cosine is the secant. One over the cosine squared is the secant squared. All good so far. If so, then we have Looks like people are still writing. Give you a moment to finish copying this down. Then that square root 
turns into the square root of five times the square root of the secant square root of theta. Then the square root of five times the secant square root of theta again. And what happens? Our square roots of five turn into five. The square root of the secant square turns into the secant. Again, there's no nonsense with this substitution. The square root and the square just cancel out. And we've got another two secant and the secant cubed, let me see. I mean, this is certainly not something we learn to take. I'm sure that somewhere in, I mean, I can take not somewhere in the textbook. I'm sure that in the section on trigonometric integrals, where we just looked at odd powers of sine and cosine, we could find instructions on how to take this. But in any event, what I wanted to demonstrate was that the square root does go away, and we do wind up with these trig functions by themselves. And that is the case. And this, this secant cubed, I think, probably is something we could integrate. In fact, I want to say in my notes, I might finish this problem out. But, and as I say, what was on this frame was what I wanted to get out of this problem. A little early, but it makes no sense to start um, the next section with 10 minutes remaining. I will see you Tuesday and again, hopefully have your uh, test or tests for you.